I'm Dr. Fujian Zhang. I'm a psychotherapist, a licensed marriage and family therapist, speaker, and an author. I would like to tell you about a seminar, The Power of Two, that I'm doing with Bernard Marchandé, which is a wonderful coach and a relationship and a business coach. This seminar is about you, about you in your relationship, the most important aspect of your life, your intimate relationship. In this seminar, you will get how you have been behaving, how you have been thinking, your belief system, and your behaviors within your intimate relationship that has created the result that you have gotten right now. And will give you a lot of tools, amazing keys in how to create a successful relationship and how to sustain and maintain it. I hope you enjoy it. Welcome back to the Inner Voice Show. We are talking to Dr. Claudia Black about addiction. Dr. Black, um, before we went for the commercials, uh, we were talking about the aspect of the culture, um, the essence of the culture and some behaviors are using some of these types of mind-altering substances pretty much as a norm. In, in the culture, whether it's uh, just a teen culture or uh, it's a custom that came, you know, with uh, maybe um, uh, maybe Persians with the opiate as it was before, or um, you know, Armenians or Russians with alcohol, and many many other cultures. Who, as someone is growing up, they are that substance is part of a ritual that they've just kind of are growing up with it. How does one really know um, in distinguishing between the ways that they're getting dependent or addicted to some aspect uh, which has been a norm in their life you know, versus um, something that they come in and utilize really as a coping mechanism? It has a lot to do with the problems in that once you become addicted, you become dependent upon the use of alcohol, drugs, whatever the addictive behavior can be about, ultimately it's going to begin to cause problems in really significant areas of your life. It's going to either cause problems in your work, it's going to cause problems in your ability to transport yourself, you lose driver's licenses. It certainly causes problems in your intimate relationships if you have a partner, a wife, a husband, it causes problems with your children, it causes legal problems, and that will escalate over time. Now, the problem here is that it's insidious again. It just slowly begins to cause problems, and so many times we don't even recognize we have a problem. We're so busy rationalizing until it's become a crisis kind of state. Also, not only is the norm in terms of the norm for young people to be out using or the norm for people in their ethnic culture, but it's even the norm from the family. And there's that sense of, if I am having a problem, what does that mean? Does that mean I don't get to be a part of what the norm has been? And the reality is there is probably somewhere between 6 to 10%, and I'm talking worldwide, of people who drink and use who but they will become addicted. And in some cultures, that's going to be much higher than that. So you know, I'm sort of really generalizing there. But there's always going to be a smaller percentage of people who, when they drink and use, it's going to become problematic for them. And the best thing for them is to learn how to be able to abstain and to find healthier coping mechanisms for them. But the biggest fact that distinguishes why uh, am I an addict and this person is not an addict is going to be really the ramifications of how it plays out in areas of my life. And it's very easy because people, by the time it's problematic, they're very adept at rationalizing, they're very adept at minimizing. They're also very adept at bringing people into their lives who are willing to rationalize and minimize with them. So I take people out of my life who are going to tell me what they see in reality, who are going to be honest with me, and I bring in what are oftentimes called enablers. And many times, those are people who are also using as well, right along with me, my party buds, so to speak. Now, I know you have worked a lot with the family members of uh, addicts and their children. Um, 
many addicts are become so self-centered at that moment and their disease of addiction becomes the only thing they're looking at and they actually utilize and um, ask everybody else to feed their addiction or they would be very angry at them if they don't. Uh, so there's, t there's an, uh, a m tremendous amount of impact on the family and children. Can you talk a little bit about a direct and a non-direct impact that uh, an addict actually has on their family system? Well, one of those is something that you just very much mentioned, that addicts often become very angry with the people that begin to challenge, begin to question their behavior. And so you see a lot of anger in the family, in many family cases. And then family members take on that blame. You see a lot of what I call false guilt. I think that I'm responsible for the fact that my husband is using so much. I feel that if I were a better wife, if I were a better partner, if I was a better kid, if I didn't make any mistakes around this household, that somehow what's happening here, and even if I don't know it's addiction, if I just somehow, he's drinking too much, he's using too much, he's unhappy, that somehow it's my fault, and that I'm supposed to be the answer for that. So you see a lot of false guilt, you see a lot of blaming that goes on. Probably what permeates addicted families more than anything, though, is going to be fear. People live very fear-bound, and different family members will cope in different ways. Some people emotionally run away. Some people literally run away, find ways to be outside of that family house as much as they can possibly be. Um, if they emotionally run away, they may emotionally run away to a different part of the house to try not to be very visible. They shut down emotionally. Uh, they can't be honest about what it is that's going on. You see a lot of sadness, uh, and for some people that sadness manifests itself in depression. So between the fear that can ultimately become anxiety and the sadness that can ultimately become depression, uh, the other consequence that you sometimes see is sometimes I'll join the person that they're using. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's the only way I get to have a relationship with my dad is if I smoke with him. Maybe the only way I could have a relationship with my wife is if I drink right along with her. And so sometimes you see them engage in the same behavior, and sometimes that person will become addicted as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I've experienced that where um, I've had clients who attempted to join because they thought this was one way of finally being able to control the addict as if if I joined with them in utilizing, uh, whether it's the using the alcohol or the drugs, then I can say how much we could use. So this um, illusion of control kind of goes, uh, extends itself to the family members. And another um, emotion that you've talked a lot about in your conferences and your books is the emotion of shame, which is underlying um, the addict itself and the probably also the element of knowing somewhere deep inside beyond the denial that they're really hooked on another substance beyond themselves. They are hooked on something that they feel so out of control and sometimes when the glimpse comes of the uh, impact and this is disaster that has gotten created whether it's financially, emotionally, legally, physically on many realm onto their family member and somehow also share that shame and dump that shame uh, onto the other family members. And I think of shame as the belief that there's something inherently wrong with who I am, that I should be able to be different than who I am. And unfortunately it becomes so self-perpetuating in that I feel shame because of my behavior and then I shame myself because of my behavior, and it just reinforces my need to drink or use even more so. And well, the counterpart is the ability to let somebody know this is beyond me. I mean, ultimately, that's the answer, is to really surrender and to recognize this is beyond my ability to have the answers for myself here. Now, I want to go back to the addicted person also does shame their other family members. And as a consequence of my behavior, I act in ways where I say to them, who you are is not okay. And then these family members come to take on that belief for themselves that who they are is not okay. So they now feel shame about what's going on with the addicted person, but they also feel that who they are, but they're not. Other words for shame are, I am in shame and I feel inadequate. 
when I feel less than, when I do not feel as if I belong. It's a profound sense that I'm unlovable, and I feel very unique in my unlovability. I think I'm damaged. Again, we don't think of ourselves as in shame, but we think of ourselves with these other kinds of terms. Mm -hmm. Now, many times when people come for treatment, if the addict is out of the denial or at least something has happened where they put themselves into some sort of a treatment, um, it's fantastic that they've taken that first step to be able to do that. Many people um, think that basically uh, treatment is about detoxing and uh, as if, if they've completed their detox and that they no longer use for extend the amount of time that their addiction is has gone away and then they attempt at one point to uh, utilize, use it socially again and gain control over it um, and so that's one sort of actual coming into treatment but there's many times that because they're still into the denial the addict themselves do not walk into any counseling center or treatment facility or AA or NA in order to start that and because of their denial it seems like one of their family member finally takes the stand in order to be to create this path and process and to begin that can you say a bit about how the process of um, recovery and treatment can begin either by the addict themselves or by one of their family members Typically, the process of recovery doesn't begin until the consequences of our addiction are so blatantly in our face that we cannot deny the relationship anymore. Sometimes the addict has the ability to see that for themselves, but oftentimes that has to be created by important people around them, and those important people are typically going to be their family members. And obviously, you can see the complexity of this because that means family members ultimately have to come out of their own denial process um, and to be willing to have the courage because it's going to mean setting some limits that is going to be oftentimes alien to what their behavior has been for the last usually many, many years. But family members ultimately can begin that process by what we call no longer enabling, no longer covering up for the addict, no longer lying for the addict, no longer uh, taking responsibility for the things that should be their responsibility. In the process of no longer doing that, the addict is, is going to see the consequences of their behavior so much more. But you also have to directly connect their consequences of their behavior to their drinking and using. And ultimately, you need to be able to say, you're going to need to get help. And that's, I mean, that's the fight. I want to be able to handle this myself. When you're addicted, it's very unlikely. I'm not saying that you can't happen for somebody, but it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to stop the behavior and to ultimately recover. And I want to go back to recovery isn't just physical abstinence. Recovery is emotional recovery. It is mental recovery. And for many people, it will be a spiritual process as well. Some people can actually learn to abstain and do that on their own. They continue to be irresponsible. They continue to lie. They continue to be depressed. They continue to be anxious. And so that's why somebody like myself and yourself would be encouraging people to go through, if it's not a 12-step program, to at least begin with the treatment process and then in many cases become more involved in the self-help uh, program to be able to embrace all of recovery. But family members are often the ones that are going to ultimately need the courage. They're going to connect the behavior to the drinking and to the using, and they're going to ultimately insist that that person go for help. And they're going to have to do it repetitively. They need a lot of courage and a lot of patience because and a um, lot of support and a lot of support because I've really seen um, as the um, confrontation begins about some of these consequences, anger shows up a lot because fa the family member finally is angry and fed up with the consequences that they are gaining because of somebody else's actions and when they begin confronting and taking a stand for it then the addict's anger raises and the blame and the shame and all of those game kind of you know begins filling up the house much more before we actually get somebody from their home to a treatment center or a counseling center what is your suggestion about this 
phase of uh, the anger and the impact of that on the family? First of all, that's exactly why these family members need a lot of support. They not only need support, they can actually use their own therapeutic process while they're getting that support. So I'm going to recommend the 12-step program of al for that support, but I'm also going to recommend that the family member can reach out and get counseling with an addiction counselor so that you are more skilled in how to stand up for yourself and to present the information to the addict in a way that it is the least blaming. Um, so that you, in essence, are very clear that you're not talking about their worth and value as a person. You're talking about their behavior and you're connecting it to what it is that they are using. So, again, I'm encouraging family members to reach out and get help before you expect the addicted person to do that. Now, and one is because, as you say to family members, at this point we are so angry we can barely contain ourselves and we can be very offensive. So that's also why you need some healthy support. When it comes to the addict, the addict doesn't say, oh, well, thank you for showing me the errors of my ways. You know, that's not going to be their first response. Their first response is to get very defensive, and that's why you need the support so that you don't take on uh, their feelings and just, in essence, feel annihilated yourself. But what I want to say is they've been angry before. Um, it's, not, it's probably not going to be any worse than any other anger you've ever seen. You're just willing to tolerate it this time. You're not willing to tolerate it in a way that you become the victim, but you're willing to know if this person's going to get angry, and in the face of their anger, I can stand tall, and I can hang on to my limits, and I can tell them what it is I need to say. But, again, that doesn't come just from your own willpower and wanting. You're really going to need some support to do that. But know that their anger is pretty much going to be, they've been angry at other times. It's their anger that just controls you as a family member. So you've really got to do a lot of self-talk that, just saying that kind of thing. It's their anger that's controlled me, and I'm not letting them going to control me anymore. And you've got to pay attention to, as family members, we lose ourselves. And what is the price you are paying? And what is the price the rest of your family is paying? Because you're too scared? Because you don't want to hear their anger one more time? The potential for what can happen to this family with recovery so far outweighs what is going to be, uh, for a brief period of time, some heightened intensity here. Um, I know you've worked with the family uh, of addicts for a long time. One of the things that have come up in, in my practice that I've seen so many times is that in actuality, when uh, the addict now gets treatment and is in recovery process, so they are in counseling, they're doing psychotherapy on their own, um, it seems like the spouse and some of the older children um, let's say like teenagers and older children, have acquired a way of behavior when the addict was fully using. So interestingly enough, when the addict is no longer using and is going through their treatment and figuring out who they are and watching and becoming aware of their behavior, sometimes then the uh, coping, like falsely coping mechanism or whatever it was being used at that time as far as behavior by the spouse, begins showing itself as if now they're the one who are reacting with shame and blame and now finally they feel safe out of all the trauma that have experienced all these years and now feel a bit of a safety there where now they can show their anger and finally have some power into saying something although they don't know how to do it yet so it comes out as offensive and it comes back as the blame and the shame and sometimes I've also seen that one of the teenagers or adult children who are still living in the system now takes on that behavior as if somebody's got to keep the family system the way it used to be and is resisting change because they have no idea how else to be in the system while the, the norm of how it used to be although it was destructive, um, they still don't know how to let go of that, so somebody else becomes destructive. Can you say a bit about that process of the family system and how that co constantly goes back into the same system, even though it might be destructive? Yeah, and we see this all the time, and that's why it's so important that whole families get treatment in terms of a family that's living together and the most significant family members are just being on that periphery of living within that family system, but if the addicted person is the only one who gets help, they have been what we call the identified patient, they've been the one doing the acting out, everybody else has been circling them, doing what they can to bring about greater stability to this family system. So let's say we pull that addict out 
of the center part of that system. They come over here, they get treatment. When you send them back into that family system, nobody else has changed. And what happens is they're either going to need to, they'll either relapse if people haven't changed in that family system, um, the stress is too great and they're too early in recovery, and or they often will simply leave that family system, and that just leaves all of the family members continuing um, to engage in what we call the codependent, co-addictive behaviors, which is self-defeating behaviors. But what also happens, which is particularly if you're more responsible kids and that hero-type partner or hero-type kid in the family, they often do become angry when recovery enters. And in part, that's maybe because it's safe for them to be angry, and it's an anger that's been held within for a long period of time. I think the point being is if the system doesn't get treatment and if the individuals within the system don't take responsibility for, as I said, their own codependency, you'll see the dynamics of addiction perpetuate themselves actually for generations. I actually do an exercise with people where I have them within a family identify how do you commit to the impairment in this family. And everybody has to identify how they contribute to the impairment in the family. And if I know how I contribute to the impairment in this family, then that also is the beginning of telling me how I can contribute to the health in this family. Now, the ways in which I might contribute is I don't say what it is I see. The ways in which I contribute to the impairment is I lie, I have secrets, um, I hide out in my room. Um, so, again, when I know what I do to contribute to what hurts this family, then I can identify where my recovery begins as to what helps this family. But it is about the system changing. Absolutely. I've even seen spouses uh, go and get this person their drug of choice again and feed it to them and say, I couldn't tolerate how they were before. Um, and then, but I couldn't even tolerate the system as it was changing. So I'm fine because although destructive, I kind of knew how to handle the other one. I just have no clue how to handle this new person that is coming and we don't know how to change. So it, it's so important to, uh, for the whole family to take responsibility for their health and mental health and uh, creation of a new system in their life. Now, I know that you have written a children's book and you were going to share with us some of the, um, some of the pages from your book. So if you could do that now, I would really love for our audience to see that. I, a little boy did a picture that I think that with children you can explain addiction to a child of any age. I think it's a matter of putting it into their terminology. And this is a picture done by a little eight-year-old. When people say to me, kids aren't affected, it says, it's, when you see at the bottom are dominoes, that's alcohol and drugs impacting the first domino, who's going to impact uh, the next domino, which is the addicted person, and then that domino is going to fall down. Can you bring it up a bit? Else. Can you bring, there you go. Okay, perfect. Yeah, okay. Perfect, perfect. And he says alcohol and drugs are like dominoes. They knock down the person who knocks down everyone else, including themselves. Mm -hmm. And then I have another picture, and I, don't, I know we don't have a lot of time, but it's really, well, this is a very poignant one. If you can see, there is a bottle in this picture, this picture here. Yes. There's a bottle, and there's love. That's a bottle of love. Yes. And off to the side, that person has written, there's no more love left. Oh. Bottle of love. And he's written, love is caring enough to help, but sometimes it simply runs yes. out. And then the guilt that we feel about not living. It is so important for, uh, for people to know the family, uh, whether they're addict or the spouse of someone who's, a, who's an addict, to know how much their behavior uh, impacts their young children. Many times they say, you know, um, they don't know, I do it in my own room, they never know that I'm using. But it's the rest of the behavior, it's the lack of who they are and their love and um, attendance and um, their being is not part of the family. And that's what's really affecting the family. And as we see it with uh, the book and the artwork, it really shows the pain that a child experiences within an addict family. I think that behaviorally you see children as young as three or four years of age, acting out the dysfunction in the family when there is addiction. And they cognitively do not understand what's going on. But as I said, behaviorally they do. And that's when they, we have the chance to see it. I think they're impacted even at a younger age. 
And as I said earlier, by the time kids are nine, they have their own denial system going on. And I have, uh, over the years, worked with children, particularly five years of age and older, and you don't see the consequences in blatant ways because they're so busy trying to uphold the system. They become hero children. They become little household social workers. They become lost children. And a small number of them become very angry, acting out children. And then they get attention for their anger and their acting out. But the real problem in the family is addiction within the family. And so one more time, the system isn't impacted. So you get all this sort of looking good kids. And it's so easy. I mean, for 35 years, people have been saying to me, my kids aren't affected. And for 35 years, i got to tell you, I know their kids are affected. And it really shows itself more as they get into their later teenage years and their adult life. They're more apt to become addicted. They chronically end up in relationships with people who are addicted. They suffer depressions and anxieties. They don't know how to trust. They don't know how to feel. Uh, careers are chosen for the wrong reasons. I mean, every aspect of their life can be affected. Absolutely. I wish I had three more hours with you, and I'm positive my audience would really love to have it and so many other hours with you. Um, I hope that everyone who would like to have some of your um, books, uh, which have been written for the public and for the family, some of your audio CDs and um, DVDs about addiction and about uh, the family system and um, everything that they can learn. They also have books that they can work through and they're like um, working through self-help books that they can work through what their issues are with it. And they can go to your website, claudiablack.com. And, uh, or Amazon.com, any of those, and uh, obtain those. Uh, I really want to appreciate for you to give me your time. I know you're so busy and lecturing all over the world, and it's been, a, it's been really an honor to have you. And hopefully I'll get a chance to speak with you as uh, you have your new books and new audio series and, uh, and uh, new revelations in the field of uh, um, psychotherapy and addiction. And uh, you would honor us again and join us and um, to give that information to our audience. Well, I wanted to be here today. I think you reach an incredible number of people who certainly, uh, some of them are very much impacted by this. We all know somebody who's impacted by this. And I want to thank you for honoring the subject. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, thank you for being with us. Until next week, have a wonderful, wonderful, and create a wonderful day and a year for yourself. Thank <laughs> you.